David, welcome to the Lake Working Group virtual meeting. Um, I'm Stephen Farrell. My co-chair is Militia. Say hi, Militia. Hello, everyone. This is Militia. Um, so I hope my screen is displaying. Uh, it'd be good if somebody would confirm that, but I presume it is. Yes, it is. Oh, we can see what about. Thanks. Right. So on that, you see the chair names, charter, mailing list, uh, Java room coordinates, uh, meeting link for this meeting, and the Etherpad. We have note takers. Uh, Joanne and Tim, I think, have agreed to take notes in the Etherpad. Thanks for that. Um, we can keep an eye on the Java room our, ourselves as chairs, I guess. And we have the note well. So this is the pointers to various bits of the IETF policy. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, you should get familiar with it and all that it says. And here's our agenda. So administrative, we're doing. Um, I, I think Francesca is, is, is able to actually do the presentation on the interop session. She wasn't expecting to be here, but now has made it. Uh, uh, then chairs, but really Militia and Karthik will talk about the formal analysis. And Joran and John, I guess, will run us through our open issues. And then we'll, at the end, just kind of as a wrap, part of the wrap up, think about what we want to get done for ITF 110, um, et cetera. And then any other business. So let's just do the agenda bash. Does anybody want to, to, to change something in the agenda, the order, the timing? Uh, anything else? Now's the time if you have something. Looks fine. Okay, good. Um, so one other issue, I guess we should have put in the slides, we didn't. Uh, if you, in the WebEx chat, if you want to join the queue to, to grab the microphone, uh, we'll use the usual convention, or what's becoming the usual convention now is if you type plus Q, if you want to join the mic line and minus Q to leave if whatever you wanted to ask has actually been handled already. Um, so again, please use the Jabber room for general chat. Mostly use the WebEx chat for joining or leaving the mic line. And I think with that, we'll move on to the second set of presentations. So give me one second. Okay. Hey. All yes. yours. Thank you. Uh, just tell me when the... to move the slide. Yes. Thanks. This is the report from the second interoperability testing of ad hoc. Um, next slide, please. So we had our second session the 22nd of January of this month. Um, this time we had three implementations that were tested against each other. Last time we had two and 13 attendees, which is much more than last time. Um, and I also collected uh, some detailed notes and uh, detailed reporting in, at, this, at this link. So you can uh, take a look if you're interested. Um, and I also wanted to point out that uh, this interop was also based on version two of the draft. And there has been some updates since then. Next slide, please. So more in details, we started by uh, uh, testing the do testing based on the test vectors on Appendix B1, which is the one uh, with uh, signature authentication, X509 certificate. So the method is zero, and the selected cipher suite that was used by the implementers is also zero with the algorithm um, mentioned here. And differently from last time, this time we also, the implementers also uh, generated uh, the some ephemeral keys, which are real ephemeral keys and not the values taken from the test vectors. And this was a great success because it, it passed with uh, uh, all implementations in all directions. So that was really, really great. And next slide, please. And we also started the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes uh, to test on a test vector for Appendix B2, which is the one uh, based on uh, authentic ad hoc authenticated with static Diffie-Hellman keys. 
and the method is method number three and the same selected cipher suites. Um, but so we started the testing, but there was some um, yeah, verification failure. And so we, we stopped there and we didn't even manage to test uh, all possible all possible directions. Right. So um, yes, I also wanted to mention we had some implementers that had implemented older cipher suites. Um, so Michel Vidiet uh, has provided additional traces for method zero cipher suite five. So if anybody has that. Uh, has implemented uh, that cipher suite and that method, they can also uh, compare and um, it will be interesting to hear. And also we got, again, good feedback from the implementers that uh, should be incorporated in the draft. Um, and we have uh, uh, also had more um, communication with other implementers that are interested uh, in participating, so we will probably continue with this uh, interoperability planning uh, testing, and um, yeah, continue Appendix Two, and then other methods and cipher suites. I think that was my last slide. Yeah. Francesca, maybe you should mention there were yeah, there were actually two more teams represented at the. At the meeting, and uh, there is another another implementation ongoing as well. So, and, and other yet others are welcome. So that we know yeah, of. I, of I mentioned that there were thirteen attendees, and some of these attendees were also also had other implementations, but uh, we didn't test them in this. That's good. That was, actually, that was going to be my question: was the discrepancy between three and thirteen was a was, was a puzzle? Um, so it's good to hear, um, and thanks everybody for doing that. Uh, I, I do have Francesca. Can you talk a little bit about um, just the the setup? The, where people in different time zones? How did you get it to work? How did it work? Uh, just well, more, mostly thinking about how we you know how we can improve things for future uh, yeah. hackathons or improvements. You might have seen that I set up a doodle uh, that I sent to the mailing list, and then I also nudged uh, implementers that uh, had contacted us or offline or had participated before to, to please answer. And that's how the, uh, the time was selected. Um, so it's really based on implementers that want to participate and then uh, try to facilitate uh, so that it's the best option for everybody. Um, <clears throat> but in this instance, were most of them in similar time zones? There was no big gap or? Yeah, exactly. Yes, we we're all in the yeah. same. And were people, was it synchronous, mixture of synchronous and asynchronous um, in terms of people being online at once or? or, or yeah, we were, or... Actually, actually, there was, uh, Michael was also in the, in the thread, but he didn't manage to join. Um, so I was saying like, oh, everybody's in the same time zone. Well, except one who <laughs> didn't manage to join. Um, but otherwise, yes, we were all online at the same time and we would, were all testing. Uh, so we were, let's say, um, I was observing, we were observers while the implementers were testing against each other and we were also gathering the feedback, uh, as authors, but yeah, it's much simpler to do this, uh, online. So all at the same time. Great. Thanks. I'll have a look at the details. Steven, I, I, I don't know if that, sorry, Steven, go ahead. No, no, after you, I just got to ask anybody other questions so far away. All right, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I, may, I don't know if that was what you were asking for, but basically they were, they were pinging between pinging and then running co-op. So that, that was basically how, how the, uh, and then ad hoc on top. That was basically how it was set up. And, and, uh, and poor Michel, he was in Canada and he, he actually didn't got, got the round to test because no one had implemented Cypher Suite 5, but all the others were in Europe. So it was Germany, Belgium, and, and Sweden, I think, was, was testing. So I guess in, in, in Jabber, Michael is asking, um, or he's commenting that the time zone was okay, but he did, his code wasn't ready. But he's he's asking to maybe try and plan this, I guess, two meetings ahead for timing purposes, so he can 
know when to prioritize coding. So I guess that's a request to try and schedule the next and the one after. If that makes sense. Yeah, sure. OK, any other questions, comments, uh, requests? Not hearing anything, so I guess we can move on. And if, if people are interested, just start by sending a mail to the list, Francesca, I guess, yeah? Yes, yes. Great stuff. And, and thanks, everybody, for the work. It's good stuff. So we'll move on. Uh, I guess, Malisha and, and Karthi, you have slides, I think? or. Yeah, yeah. So I can take over. We don't have any slides prepared. This is just more. Uh, this is more to inform the working group. So I mean, I will lead this both as a chair and as, uh, as a participant of the meeting we uh, we had with Katik, and then Katik can, can fill me in if he's still online. Uh, essentially, as chairs of the working group, we want to ensure that the that the specifications that we produce are high quality. And since we are in the security area, we do want uh, we do want to involve the academic community and to perform formal verification and analysis of the protocol that we are standardizing. Uh, to that end, we had uh, we had a presentation during the summer ITF uh, on formal uh, formal verification of ad hoc uh, of an earlier version of ad hoc using the Tamarin tool in the symbolic model, which means essentially that uh, the crypto uh, crypto is abstracted and uh, seen as a black box. And then uh, the, the, uh, the, the protocol had several issues found there, and I think we resolved most of those. Uh, one of the out direct outputs of this analysis is that we added message for optional message for uh, authors. Please, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in order to confirm uh, for for key con explicit key confirmation in the absence of uh, implicit confirmation through application tracks. Uh, continuing that discussion, uh, I was thinking what would be the best next steps, and we discussed this with Kastik, who is leading the Prosecco team within INRIA in France, who specializes in formal verification of protocols and implementation. And uh, we have uh, Kastik and his team have ongoing plans on uh, performing uh, an analysis of ad hoc using the computational model and the crypto verif tool, which would essentially give us uh, uh, probability bounds uh, for different kinds of attacks. And as a function of the different uh, crypto modules that are used, the crypto algorithms that are used, and their probabilities and their corresponding probabilities. Uh, so this is something that Kartik and his team plan on working on. Kartik, please fill me in if uh, I'm mistaking something or if I haven't been complete. Uh, but then also, apart from the protocol itself, we do want to uh, ensure that the uh, implementation that uh, we produce and that we test as part of, or as part of the interop testing event are also secure. And what that means is, uh, in, to that end, what we in Indria did is that uh, we are trying to uh, formally verify the C implementation using the F star language, uh, which is an output of the uh, Prosecco team at Indria again, uh, in order to uh, study different pro security properties of the implementation, such as memory safety, uh, functional correctness, etc. So to this end, in the next couple of months, we will be working uh, with Kartik's team uh, on uh, modularizing our code, uh, the implementation of ad hoc uh, within the OpenWSM project in order to make it ready for the uh, crypto verification using FSTAR. And at the end of this process, we hope to have a formally verified implementation. Uh, so those would be the two main points that we have. We still don't have a clear timeline, but we hope to uh, have a better visibility over this for the next ITF meeting and to present this to the working group. So if there are any comments, uh, please, please shout. Uh, just clarify. Maybe, uh, yeah, go on.
So I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm not sure who else was talking there. Sorry. Um, you, so you're looking at a, a, a verification of an implementation. Wh whose implementation is that? Sorry, I wasn't clear. So that's a Timot that is Timothy's implementation within the OpenWSM project. And, and just from my yeah. understanding, is that that's not that's nothing to do with Inria as an implementer. You're only being a tester in that role. So this is Inria's implementation that Timothy is leading. Ah, okay, so it's an it's an in-house implementation and test. Great. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So somebody else wanted to talk again. If you want to use the mic line, feel free. If we don't need it, if there's only one or two people over. I'll, I'll just do a small clarification on on the goals of this point two here, uh, at least from my viewpoint, and maybe people can respond to that as well. I think what would be nice, and I think that we all agree in the working group more or less, but it's worth stating this out clearly, is at the end of the uh, process, uh, we have multiple proofs in different models that are complementary and that, that may kind of exercise all the corners of the spec. So currently we have the, the nice Tamarin model, which is a comprehensive symbolic analysis, so the idea is to complement it in two different directions. One to have a computational cryptographic proof using CryptoVerif, and the third one is to do an analysis of a of a reference implementation, so to speak, of uh, of ad hoc, so that we are sure that we are not in these models because the models typically leave out certain details because otherwise the proofs would never be possible. But when you're analyzing an implementation, you're sure that, especially if it interrupts, that you're sure that it. Uh, captures all the details, so you then close up the final problems that might come up in the state machine implementation or packet formatting and stuff like that, which would be ignored in both Tamarin and CryptoVerif. You still have to verify things about it, and that's what you verify in the uh, reference implementation. So that's the basic idea between these two different projects that Malisha just described. And I'm sure there are, if we could get interest from other groups, there would be more things to do as well. But these are, I think within these three, you would have a pretty nice coverage of all the specs. Anyway, that's my two cents. And please ask questions and comments. Uh, Kartik, could you um, please uh, repeat which uh, which um, verifications you are doing? The Tamarin was one. Uh, it's just for note keeping. No, Tamarin. Just so, uh, maybe I can add, add just to that. So yeah, the Tamarin. Uh, the Tamarin modeling was done by a team from University of Copenhagen, uh, KTH, and Ericsson. And that uh, that there was there is a preprint available, uh, an archive, and uh, they have. I talked to the author, and they have uh, essentially rewritten the paper with an extended analysis. And uh, that's been sent to a conference. It's been submitted, uh, and they wait for a response for that, probably in March sometime. So that's the status of, and that I, they actually managed to cover uh, some of the cases uh, which they didn't cover in the preprint. So it's it's fairly comprehensible by now. Sorry, go ahead, Kartik. Uh, no. Uh... I didn't have much else to add to that. The uh, uh, so the Tamarin analysis, yes, as Oran says, has already been done, or is in the process of publication, but it's done uh, by a different group. We are proposing to do a computational cryptographic proof using CryptoVerif, which is a tool which I can send a link around to later if need be on Etherpad. And the uh, verified implementation will be done using FSTAR, which is a third tool, which it focuses on verifying code, uh, interoperable reference code in C. Um, so there would then be these three different proofs with three different tools, which hopefully gives sufficient coverage on all the design elements of ad hoc. Okay, thanks. I think this great news earlier review by CFRD and Academia had have uh, led to a lot of smaller changes, also a lot of clarifications and Eukartik has already heavily influenced the focus on forward security. Yeah. We're look, really looking forward to this. That's great. So there's one question that still comes up when we are doing this kind of analysis, which is um, uh, in terms of what is, I mean, is there a documented target security level for ad hoc? Like, I mean, if for example, uh, we, if you wanted to say that, okay, uh, 
Cypher should zero should provide 128 bit security, two should provide 80 bit security, and so on. Then there is something to also check during a computational analysis, which is because there you can actually check the concrete security bounds and make sure that each of these cipher suits meets its desired security level. And uh, uh, currently looks like, uh, well, I don't know what exactly the current understanding for, I guess this also is inherited a bit from OSCOR because we use short tags and so on. So there must be some target security level that we are aiming for. Uh, for TLS, it's 128 usually is what most of the cipher suits aim for. But uh, if there is a specific discussion that has already been happened, it will be nice to know so that we can make sure we conform to that discussion. I don't think we have had any such discussion or that is written down at least concretely. I think for in general, it's I think 128 bit security level for confidentiality. Um, hopefully, but uh, 64 for integrity, which might also affect confidentiality, of course, for active attackers. Um, okay. Maybe at some point it'll be worth starting a thread on the mailing list just to get yeah. consensus on these. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then it's definitely different per cipher suit. Some of the cipher suits have longer tags, and the newly added cipher suits aiming for higher than 128 bit security complying with CNSA, yeah. So okay. on that, Karthik, I, I think it's a good idea to, to create a thread on the list with that discussion. It would seem to me that there's nothing special, particularly about Lake in that, that's, you know, if we do reach consensus in the working group on, let's say, 128 for confidentiality and 64 for integrity, it's probably worthwhile bringing that up on the security area list in the ITF because presumably the same thing will apply in other working groups uh, that are concerned about constrained devices. Indeed, for constrained devices, yeah. I think yeah. that's the, the tag size, which is the only place where we seem to make some compromise here. And so figuring out what the impact of that is would be, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, I think having a common security target at that level across multiple working groups is probably a worthwhile thing to do. Yeah, agreed, yeah. Okay. Um, any militia? No, I, I think we can go ahead. So this was just essentially a heads up for the working group on the plans that we have in this domain. Great stuff. Okay, uh, do, do you want me to present slides for the next one or do you want to take over? Uh, please present. Happy to do that? Yeah. Um, so if it helps, I can, um, at any point, I can kind of pop up the, the issue tracker. Uh, if you want me to do that, just say, okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Off you go, just tell me when to move the slide. Yeah. So. Uh, this is uh, presenting the changes and uh, closed and open issues uh, in version 04. We submitted version 04 uh, yesterday. And take next slide. Uh, so main changes is that we are uh, based on developer feedback. We are more or less going back to the solution in 02, but completely changing this the description of it. We it raised concerns that we were associated with the source cipher. Now we described it it as we using HKDF expand as an add binary additive stream cipher. Uh, according to our understanding, this provides better confidentiality than, than ASCTR, which actually is, is a permutation that don't really uh, um, do very well. Uh, uh, but I, I have more detailed slide on this later. So we have specified message four as option to support as discussed. So far, we have not specified any signaling, instead making key confirmation mandatory. 
Then uh, the cipher suit well, has been discussed for a long term. Now we have implemented the suggestion from Stephen from last meeting that uh, one and two should be implemented uh, by more non-constrained and uh, more constrained devices should implement one of them. Uh, then there is new added text on error messages and uh, there has been a rewriting and restructuring of section one to adopt to the changes that has been and make it better. Next slide. So this is the open issues. Um, I don't know, do you want to say something about them, Joran? Or otherwise we can... Uh, no, no just, oh. just go ahead. Yeah, then move next slide, I think. So here's closed issues. Uh, so we don't specify ad hoc as a chem. It didn't work out really. Uh, then we have sold hopefully the Cyphersuit issues. Uh, PSK, this, the name is PSK, but the issue is really lightweight forward secrecy that has now been implemented in the ad hoc rekey FS function. I think this will need more work later and interaction with core. Uh, no resumption, check and KMAC is done, Cyphersuits with high security is done, and we have added a reference to the COSI CBOR certificate work. We have uh, gotten several requests to provide test vectors for CBOR certificates and also for uh, their encoded certificates, which will come later. Uh, next. Um, oh, uh, so, sorry, can I just interrupt for a second, yes. Renee? Please and the previous slide, um, I saw that apparently, so what's the status of this year, 512 versus 256? Of uh, SHA-256, it's the same as before, no changes. Rene, is your question? I saw the discussion in December that uh, 512 would uh, not really be supported, right, by most devices. So how how are we going to get to interoperability if... Uh, uh, what are we doing now? What is the, what is the normative text? I couldn't find it. The new normative... Uh, it's in zero four. I don't know. It says that you should one cipher suit is as before EDDSA. Uh, it's it's basically half of the comments we have gotten is that EDDSA is the way to go. People like that. They can use threshold, and they have no problem implementing it. The other half is saying we can only support SHA two hundred fifty six with ECDSA. So there is no changes to the cipher suits. The normative text is that you should support both, but if you cannot, you can choose one. Is it normative uh, shell language instead of shoot? Joran, can you read this text? Yeah, Rene, please, please. Uh, the, the, okay, so there are two, uh, or, or, or Stephen, if you could flip back two slides or three. Uh, there, thank you. So bullet three, that's the normative text. And the reason for should instead of shall uh, was that uh, there was an input from Michael Richardson last meeting that if we really want to nail down all the um, the mandatory to implement, uh, not only related to Cypher suites, and, and then we should make it in a separate draft. And uh, this draft should only contain a recommendation. Yeah, so I, I sent a list. Uh, I, I see you re probably recall I had the presentation at the December 18 interim, right? And at the time, and I looked up in the minutes, it was also suggested to uh, to support that, which I have not seen in for, uh, the Ford uh, ref yet. But uh, I sent an email to the list about uh, the best current practice about uh, mandatory to implement algorithms. And I think that would be good guidance for uh, uh, getting to a conclusion on that, right? 
So then if, if I'm you just can uh, dig up that email and send it back to the list again, right? Uh, you hide an ad. So yes, I remember the email. This was just before the holidays, if I uh, if I recall correctly. So essentially, you are you are not happy with the current phrasing. I mean, uh, of having two algorithms uh, proposed, and with a should uh, implement both of them if the device is less constrained. Is, am I hearing? Well, right? I, I think if you, if if you're you're going standard track, right? So. And then uh, I think you should uh, foster interoperability of devices and also use implementations that uh, 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 that foster interoperability in a low cost way, right? So, so what is your proposal, Rene? Proposal is to uh, 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 support uh, SHA-256, which is supported by uh, m most uh, hardware, as, as, as least as I know, as far as I know, and uh, not go for uh, Cypher Suite 0 and 2, because uh, there's essentially uh, Cypher Suite 0 and 4 of 512, which is not supported by lots of devices. I just checked it on your GitHub uh, web page as well, right? So, uh, J John uh, mentioned that we have a problem with the, the community some of split time in two parts, where one part is, is targeting EDDSA only, and the other part is targeting ECDSA only. And how do we solve that? Yeah, so I, I, the problem I have is that I have not seen any discussion since December 18 on this particular topic, and now suddenly it's, it's marked as closed. Where, where's, it, where's the working group feedback on that, right? I think we had a discussion last time. This was the but, but, uh, suggestion well, uh, that uh, even in, in, in the It was just a remark by Michael Richardson, but uh, that's not necessarily yeah. a working group consensus. So, so that the chairs didn't declare working or ask for or declare working group consensus on this specific point. Um, so it's, I don't think it's closed, um, but uh, I, I, I think that probably the best thing is if uh, Renee, if you want to sort of refresh that thread on the mailing list, um, and then we can we can sure, see if we have a consensus on one, on one way or the other. Yeah. Okay, that's good, good if you good add the issue in in GitHub. There is where all the basically most of the discussion is, and where the, all the people developing are commenting. We could we could reopen the implement the mandatory shot twelve issue, but maybe it's better if you formulate your it in your own words, Rene. Yes. Yeah, I think this is probably also one to bring to the list. Um, I mean. Probably in, in mind, but I think in this case, there's, you know, there may be people who are on the mailing list who are not active in GitHub who yeah. will have an opinion here. So, so let's do this one on the list. Thank you. Okay, so let's then move on. We have 20 minutes, 23 minutes left in the meeting. So I propose uh, we move on with the, with the issues. Yes. Uh, so here is encryption of uh, message two based on developer feedback. So basically we have the current zero four is more or less reverting back to zero two. Technically it's the same solution, but the label is different. It's key stream instead of K. Uh, and the description of how it works is quite different, but technically it's the same, same. Uh, the candidate, the other two solution has been not been favored by implementations. It's, they see it as complicated. So, and zero one was not dropped because it's insecure. It was dropped because at least the description of it raised uh, comments. Uh, I think the developers are happy with this current uh, solution as far as we have seen. Uh, and that is to use HKDF expand as a binary address stream cipher that fulfills all the requirements that I can see. Next slide. 
going through this fast as we are short of time. So uh, if you have any comments, shout up and we take time to discuss that topic. Uh, then optional message four. This was raised by, suggested by Carl, who did a formal verification to, at GitH together with IT University of Copenhagen. Um, uh, this message is very simple. It basically only contains a MAC and then a correlation identifier. Uh, it's optional to to implement and optional to use. Uh, it's basically the current ID in ad hoc is that you rely on application protocol to get key confirmation to the responder. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the ID in TLS 1.3 also. It was pointed out that Carl that not all uh, uh, all app users might use an application protocol at all. And now we have added a ad hoc message for that basically replaces sending an application layer protocol like OSCOR. Uh, and you can use that if you use authentication only, or maybe if you use only one way application protocol. It was discussed earlier that there should be some signaling that could then be in message one or message three. After thinking about it, our suggestion would be to not add any signaling. We think this is kind of a small use case and instead we would like to make key confirmation mandatory. So if the initiator is not sending any application data they are required to send. Ad hoc uh, message for. Um, I think th this would need to be implemented and hopefully some more comments in the future. But that's the high level plan at currently. Uh, there's no comment. Yeah, next slide. Uh, then uh, issue is should there all the other messages have uh, auxiliary data? Should there be an auxiliary data in message four? Uh, and yeah, open question adds complexity, but only for message four, which is optional. Makes it look like the other messages, but so far nobody has expressed that they need this either. Uh, so this will st stay open for a while, I guess, and receive comments. Uh, Any comments now? Against. Any comments now from anyone in this meeting? Okay, thanks. Next, forward backward secrecy. Uh, this is the we have changed the name of this update function. Basically, it's a function rekeying the key used in the exporter. This is a very lightweight way to get um, forward secrecy. Uh, and this work is heavily influenced by the earlier comments by Kartik. Uh, this relies a lot on core, where OSCORE would have to, is the main application protocol that would ask ad hoc for forward secrecy. So I think I think the main building places and IDs are now in place, but uh, the details would come later when core starts working more on this. Uh, next slide. So error message diagnostics uh, was comments that um, both a little bit unclear how error messages works and how to distinguish error messages from non-error messages. Uh, so we have added quite a lot of text to the specification after a dialogue with implementers. Uh, the idea is that error message is, can, is distinguished as it contains a text string which none of the other messages do. We also changed the 
name of this text string from error message to diagnostic message. Uh, then we have clarified that the intention that all error messages are fatal. They close down the the uh, the protocol, uh, but also that they are not authenticated so if you send them you know this is fatal if you receive them you you it might be an attacker sending it you should consider that um, then the other thing is that uh, basically there when suit r suits r are included it's meant for the ad hoc application uh, when you use this text string uh, and if suits are not included, then it's a diagnostic message meant for human readable. It should be logged, mainly used for some engineer debugging. We have a now we have a mandatory that this needs to be a basically a debugging error in English. Uh, has earlier been, I think this. This fulfills all the requirements that the developer opening this issue had. There's all been further discussion whether the diagnostic messages would need to be standardized, could have standardized text strings, or you could have standardized codes. Uh, but there has not been a clear uh, requirement on that yet. That's still up for discussion. I think the, the text would still need some more guidance on when to send the error message. But basically, the idea is if anything goes wrong, it's fatal and you send the error message. So the, the question really is, um, do you have to act on these things? So um, given that, that you already closed down, the the connection the the implementation does not have to act on this all, all diagnostics are the same from the point of view of the implementation um, the question is is there going to be a human who looks at these diagnostics and and does different things based on different values of these messages and is not a software engineer that that, that is actually debugging the thing right now but does, does that ever come up in an operational context? And if you have an operational context where it's important to actually distinguish different kinds of diagnostics, uh, like the, the key is expired or whatever kinds of specific diagnostics that, that an, an operational person might want to act on, oh, I, I have to renew some certificate or whatever, um, then it's actually then it actually may be useful to to standardize uh, not necessarily diagnostic messages but at least categories of diagnostic uh, messages so that that a user interface can give you a, a Chinese message uh, the the key is expired get a new one or whatever these diagnostics would tell an operational person. Yep. That could make sense. I guess you, that's a suggestion from you. I think we would, would need to, I think that would be quite easy adding an integer or some prefix of the text string or something and categorize that. I assume looking at TLS 1.3 would help. Um, could be a good guidance of what kind of messages could be considered. Yeah, so, so maybe that, that's a good thing to actually throw over the fence to IoT ops and, and ask them what, what kind of operational information do you want out of these error messages? Good, good uh, idea, Karsten. So how do we do that? Is that an email to IoT Ops or is it uh, yep, something else? Good. I think it's an email. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so who, does somebody want to volunteer to send that mail? Uh, yeah, I can send it. Great, thank you. Yeah. 
So next slide. Uh, then there is um, additional uh, issue related, but um, asking how can we distinguish between other messages? And this was first from Marco, and then there was another developer also commenting on the same thing. I think it was uh, Peter. Yeah. Uh, I think this needs some more consideration. I think the initial idea of ad hoc was that you would not use that, that this would be solved by the lower layers, but, and I'm not sure if there is something missing or if the implementation thoughts in ad hoc is not aligning with how people would like to implement this. I think this needs to be analyzed and considered further and maybe there will need some addition to the messages or guidance how to distinguish them. Um, so just as a time check, we're, we're 10 minutes from the end, I guess. We have about six slides left. Um, I, I think probably perhaps the best thing to do is if, if people are okay running over five or 10 minutes, try and get to the end. Is that okay? Okay, Great. for me. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's proceed. Yeah, next. Uh, so, length values when using an exporter. This was open uh, one, two weeks ago uh, by Marco. Uh, so, yes, right now when using ad hoc, the lengths of the key and the salt you export are fixed. The length of the key is uh, the uh, key length of the AAD used, but OSCORE is deriving keys from this master key, so this could potentially be longer. And then the master salt is set to eight bytes. This could potentially be shorter if you have a longer key or longer if you more want more randomness. Eight was a compromise and a trade-off. And Marcus is suggesting that these numbers are made defaults instead of uh, being required and that an application to parties can agree on other things. Uh, and this would this would this would definitely work would maybe somewhat lower interoperability would would add flexibility. Um, I don't, don't know if you want to say anything on why you want this. Yeah. yeah, just to clarify, I think they are good default values, by the way, but uh, there are chances they can get them um, through other protocols, for instance, a possible uh, ad hoc oriented uh, profile of ACE with an authorization server mediating and knowing the preferred values uh, for the or the responder essentially uh, at its registration time uh, and then synchronizing uh, the initiator later on during the ACE workflow as an example, but there can be many more. Any comments, anybody positive to doing this or negative? I... I think it makes sense if there are use cases that want to do that. Okay, next slide. And please, please discuss all these things on, on the list or on GitHub. There are issues for everything there. Then pa passing information to the application is an issue. The, the current um, document says that if there is an error, you should not pass everything to the application. But of course, in the case of an error, uh, in the case of an error, you probably want to send uh, basically the whole message stream as a debug message for logging diagnostic. 
So I think here the documentation need to be updated. Not really as an ordinary error message, but it should be logged. We should not forbid EDOC to, to uh, log this information for the bugging. Yeah. Next. Uh, then more ways here. Uh, uh, there was has been several requests to add real certificates. Um, uh, for example, both CBOR certificates and X509, they're encoded. Uh, we added now a reference to the CBOR certificates. They are uh, basically similar as the X509. Uh, and then uh, using a kid to identify a certificate has also been discussed in COSI. We should align with that. Uh, I think there are quite a lot of certificate raw public key issues that we need to bring up for discussion at the, at the next ITF. Uh, but so far, this is just a very simple addition, similar to X509. You can also now, we have examples of using CBO certificates. Next. Uh, test vectors. Uh, is, do you want to go through this, Francesca? Um, I think she just left for another meeting. Okay. Yeah. So, but, oh, you're here. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, these were the um, additions that were done to, or that, that came from feedbacks uh, from um, uh, the interop, both the first and the second one. And um, we have started uh, doing some of this. For example, we obsoleted the, the test vectors and we started the adding the TH4 output and export and export export their outputs to the test vectors. but. To, to do the rest of this, we um, we have to like regenerate new test vectors and change the values. Uh, probably we need to check the code, but um, we haven't done so because we want to continue the, in the interop based on the same test vectors. Yeah, and then other additions will be um, adding CBOR certificates and possibly later ASN1 or there certificate, encoded certificates, and then uh, more cipher suites. Yeah. I don't know if Joran or John, you want to say anything more about that? I think that was a good summary. Um, so unless there's any questions, we can take the next slide. Uh, recent issue um yeah so there's a question recently open issue question why um why we restrict the number of uh, parameters in the cozy key uh discussed it shortly this is not strictly necessary i think but on the other hand if we allow all parameters we need they need to the parties need to agree on not only the content but also the ordering so that would be need to be specified then i think this is an ongoing will be an ongoing discussion on github then there is a change message one format and this is related to the distinguish between different messages but here is a concrete uh, suggestion from Peter, that we should have a connection identifier also in message one. Um, and yeah, uh, these have not been discussed. This was recently, very recently open, so I don't have so much comments, um, except that there are newly opened issues. Uh, next slide, unless anybody have comments. Yeah.
as a summary, I, just adding one word here is that the, uh, I mean, we are going back now somehow to, to things that are, looks very much like version 02 of the draft. So it's, it should be, and the changes we make are only changes that will, will impact test vectors, but it's, so we haven't really changed the, the actual protocol in the, in the large, in the long time now, uh, which I think is good, but, uh, yeah, more more issues pop up, and we try to try to resolve them. But it, the main discussion has been on on GitHub. So if people have only followed the the, the email list, then that uh, that wouldn't have given a, a sort of fair um, view of what has actually been happening. So uh, I encourage people to look at uh, issues, but we can also bring things to the mailing list as as people like. Thanks. Great, thanks. And yes, I mean, I think, you know, I've encouraged people to the, discuss things on GitHub. Uh, I mean, obviously, clearly think that, you know, finally evaluating working group consensus is something that will happen based on drafts on the list. But, uh, uh, and for example, with the, the Cypher suite, uh, shoulds and musts and so on, we, we might want to, we'll, we'll try and get that pinned down on the list soon. Okay, uh, the, uh, any other issues on um, these ad hoc status and issues or with draft four? Not hearing any. Um, um, so Michael is saying we need the GitHub to mailing the summary configured. It is, I, I guess it is configured. Um, I, I believe I see those mails on Sunday mornings. Uh, can somebody else confirm that? then it must be obvious that the GitHub activity is seen by the mailing list, despite what Yaron just said. Yeah, so I, I, the, the GitHub issue mail goes to the list. Um, I believe everybody's seeing it, but if not, that would be good to know. Um, uh, I don't know if it's informative enough to be particularly useful. But that's, that's not the end of Michael, maybe you're referring to the holiday period when there was no activity on GitHub, and I think two weeks passed without any email generated by the script. But uh, I think the the digest is generated properly whenever there is activity. Yes, what I was referring to that the actual discussion takes place there. The, the actual comments from the, from the implementers and from from others take place there. So we haven't had any real discussion on on the. On the mailing list, but uh, yeah, but so, so I mean, there has been some, but not huge. I mean, it's been over the holiday period discussion in GitHub. There is a weekly mail generated. I, I think I'm displaying one on the screen there from uh, last Sunday. Uh, as Melissa says, if if there's no change on on GitHub, there's no mail. Uh, and and I personally don't find that mail particularly informative. Nor do I find the notifications if you're subscribed. So you, it takes a bit of work. Um, and I don't, Michael, I guess I don't think there's a need for the editors at this point to kind of create a mail thread for each issue they think is nearing resolution. Um, maybe we might get to that later. But just with the, um, I think with the, you know, issuing drafts, with the interoperability and so on, I think we're doing okay for now. Um, with the exception of that issue Rene raised, which we will bring to the list. Um, is that okay for everyone? Great. Okay, and we're trying to finish in a couple of minutes. The other thing we had on the uh, agenda was ITF one ten. Again, I think this might be almost a no op. I had two questions. One is um, whether the people implementing um, are okay to kind of coordinate with these all the changes that they expect between now and the next time they do a, a, a hackathon event or something around ITF one ten. Or if they need the working group to have kind of a draft five produced that they'll implement too. So in other words, do we need a draft five or draft six, whatever it happens to be, so that the implementers can know what to code to before the next interop event? Or are the implementers okay without that? Uh, Marco here, I'll try to catch up with uh, the latest version published already. It would be good to have a zap on further big things that can come up on top of them. 
Uh, sorry, Marco. Just, just I wasn't entirely clear of the the the, the upshot there. Can you be specific? D do you need a new a, a version five or six, or whatever, before ITF one ten to implement to, or are you okay with keeping up with the latest in GitHub? I am. Yeah. You're okay with keeping up with the latest in GitHub. Yeah. Okay. And any any other thoughts on that? And if the answer is everybody's okay with keeping up with the GitHub thing, then that's fine. So I think it just add, adding from, from from the interop, uh, the people had implemented version two, and uh, I mean the natural step now is actually to move to version four because because this uh, yeah as we've talked about it's it's basically aligning with version four, uh, so that that would be the next step. So I think that version four is a, is a natural upgrade if, if people have the time. Or otherwise, we interop with with version two. Those who still have that version. Which which has been the same for six months before that. So so that that's what people have generally. Great, and that's okay. If if the implementers are all fine with that, that's great. Um, just wanted to check. And then second thing I had for ITF one ten is: have we got a spe any specific goals or issues that we'd like to try and close off? Uh, we don't need the answer right now. We can do that on the on the mailing list. Um, but just yeah, what are our goals for ITF one ten? Uh, any specific things people want to bring up now to say we really should sort this one out in that time frame, or is it okay to just keep as we've been doing and letting the editors figure out which of the issues to, are worth trying to pin down? I'm kind of hearing nothing, so that's that's good. So I think that that says uh, for ITF 110, we'll proceed as as in this meeting and and previously we'll let the editors say here's the list of issues and here's the ones we want to try and talk about pin down. Yep, sounds good. Okay, that's all I had. Sorry for dragging you over six minutes late, uh, Militia, Anything else from you? Uh, no, not really. But is there any other business? I uh, hear none, so I guess we can close the meeting. Great. Thanks all for taking part, and we'll talk to you in the sometime in, in what normally would be an ITF meeting. Yes, sounds good. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Great. Kyle. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.